Thank you for joining us. We will now begin the event. Hello, and thank you for joining us for the spring semester town hall for Vanderbilt University staff and postdoctoral fellow members. My name is Crystal Clark, and I am the Director of Employee Learning and Organizational Effectiveness and Human Resources. Today, I will be moderating this town hall, and I'm really excited to be here to spend this time with you all. And I'd like to start by introducing our panelists for the town hall today. We have Eric Kopstein, our Vice Chancellor for Administration, Pam Jones, Associate Vice Chancellor for Health and Wellness, and co-leader of Vanderbilt University's Public Health Central Command Center, Cleo Rucker, Chief Human Resources Officer, and Jim Kendall, Manager of Work-Life Connections. Now we will be taking questions that were submitted in advance of the town hall during the Q&A session and each uh, with each of our panelists. And additionally, we have enabled Zoom's question and answer feature during this town hall so that we can take live questions. So now I'd like to welcome Vice Chancellor Eric Kopstein to say a few words. Eric? Well, thank you, Crystal. And I wanna start by thanking everyone who's tuned in today and more broadly, I wanna acknowledge the ongoing heroic efforts of Vanderbilt staff in the wake of the pandemic. This has been a major challenge in so many ways and remarkably now nearly two years in, we're still at it with so many on-campus employees continuing to keep day-to-day -day operations up and running and many other staff continuing to work flexibly and effectively amidst this rapidly evolving landscape. I wanna emphasize that our philosophy remains the same. We will do everything necessary to carry out our mission, to teach and educate our students and conduct groundbreaking research and do all of that in person in a residential educational setting. That is what we do and how we do it and that will all continue. Now, of course, we remain very mindful of pursuing our mission as safely as possible and are constantly monitoring the on-campus, regional, national, and international data, trends, and reports on COVID and confer frequently with our VUMC colleagues. We know we're in an intense period right now with Omicron spreading so rapidly. And with this in mind, we encourage managers to remain highly flexible and allow staff who can to work from home whenever possible. And when coming to campus, we've reinstated indoor masking under all circumstances and encourage physical distancing and de-densification whenever possible. We're starting the semester off with the Commodore CARES period where activities will be rather limited and focused on coursework and other essential activities. We'll be reassessing constantly and we'll ease restrictions as soon as we feel it's warranted. Pam's gonna talk soon about our COVID testing plans for spring. And you'll also hear from Jim Kendall about the criticality um, of mental health and well-being. We know this has been a struggle and I want us to appeal to our best selves to do all we can to continue to step up and follow protocols at a time when I know most of us are very fatigued by all of this. Also, please, please, please get a booster dose of COVID vaccine as soon as you're eligible. And if you have not yet uploaded your booster record, please do that as well. That action and information are so important um, for us. Now, the good news is that while we cannot predict the behavior of COVID with perfect um, prescience, if our experiences here in Nashville mirror what's been happening in other parts of the globe, it seems likely that this Omicron surge will remain intense for a period of time, but that we can hope to see a rapid decline in cases that will hopefully begin by the end of January or sooner. And meanwhile, more and more data is showing that as infectious as Omicron is, the virulence of this variant is lower. And people who are vaccinated and boosted can generally expect only to experience mild symptoms from Omicron. So please remain strong and vigilant and get your booster. Thank you, Vice Chancellor Kopstein. I wanna jump right into our questions, which includes questions that were submitted by our staff members. So my first question for you is, you spoke about the changes to our protocols for the spring semester. Can you tell us a little bit more about the reasoning behind pushing back the start of the spring semester for students? Sure, and thanks, Crystal, for that good question. Um, it was during the winter break last week that we made the decision to push back the spring semester start by one week. 
And I'll emphasize that as always, the process for making that decision was well-informed and reasoned and involved a wide range of leaders from across the enterprise and particularly from academic affairs. So it was a very intentional and collaborative process to reach that decision. The key things we knew were that one, Omicron is spreading very rapidly and health guidance and the situation are changing very quickly as well. Two, we are resolute about in-person teaching and residential education. And three, our academic calendar could be modified to start a week late while still ensuring we have a normal spring break for our students to rest and recharge and that we could push back by a week without disturbing graduation. So um, Crystal, with these many factors in mind, we once again thought about time as a strategic asset and one we'd use in this case to get us closer to what we hope will be a rapid decline of Omicron while buying some additional time to prepare and monitor the health landscape, all while maintaining our unwavering commitment to in-person learning. Excellent, thank you. Now we've received some questions about why we can't mandate the vaccine anymore. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yes, certainly. Um, you'll recall Vanderbilt had mandated vaccines for our entire community back in the spring of 2021 um, as a term of employment for faculty and staff and as a registration requirement for students. Vanderbilt was one of the very first employers in Tennessee to mandate vaccines in our direction um, was in essence endorsed when the federal government passed executive order 14042, which mandated that federal contractors of which we are one require employee vaccinations. Now in mid November of 2021, the Tennessee state legislature passed sweeping legislation that counteracted federal executive order 14042 and thereby precluded Vanderbilt from taking any adverse actions against employees and students for refusing to show proof of COVID-19 vaccinations. So our situation in regard to disabling Vanderbilt's vaccine mandate authority is a condition imposed upon us by our state and we follow state laws. Um, of course, the legal and legislative environment around COVID is also rapidly uh, evolving. And should circumstances at the state level change in this regard, we would gladly and quickly reinstate vaccine and booster mandates to protect our community and improve public health outcomes, particularly given the intensively in-person nature of so many of our campus activities. Excellent, thank you so much. And last question for right now, um, how are we going to ensure that people follow the university's COVID protocols and guidelines? Who do we get in touch with if we see VU community members not complying with COVID policies, such as wearing our mask indoors and maintaining physical distancing? Well, this is another great question, uh, Crystal. Thank you. And you know, first and foremost, following COVID protocols and acting responsibly during a pandemic is a personal responsibility. Um, I implore all members of our community to continue to act responsibly. And we'll note that as difficult as this has been and continues to be, the spirit of community that defines Vanderbilt and which includes responsibility and stepping up has never been more apparent than during the pandemic. Of course, you know, if people experience situations on campus where others are not following protocols, one thing everyone should feel comfortable doing is speaking up and asking the non-compliant person to do the right thing, whether it be to put on their mask or physically distance when possible. But also know that our public health hotline is still operational and is managed by our Vanderbilt Public Safety Dispatch. So people can call 615-343-1352 um, to report non-compliance. And they can also do so using the Vandy Safe, Safe app. Um, staff members also can report non-compliance issues to their managers as well as their human resources consultants. So lots of options. Um, and I'll just close out this question by again, emphasizing success begins with each of us acting responsibly. Excellent. Thank you so much, Vice Chancellor Kopstein. Now I'd now like to turn it over to our next panelist for today. Pam Jones is Associate Vice Chancellor for Health and Wellness and co-leader of Vanderbilt University's Public Health Central Command Center. Pam will talk to us about the latest COVID-19 trends on campus, what we currently know about the Omicron variant and our 
testing and contact tracing protocols for the spring semester. Pam? Thank you, Crystal. And I apologize profusely to the group for not being on camera. I am um, traveling and am having major uh, internet problems. So I apologize for that. But uh, great to be here with everybody. And let me just echo what Eric said, the, the contribution of our staff throughout this pandemic has been truly remarkable. And we see evidence of that every day when we watch our leaders and, and frontline managers and frontline staff try to navigate all the challenges that have been presented to us and, and go above and beyond to care for our community and our students. So, um, you know, we, we just can't say thank you enough. We would be in a much different place if we didn't have such a committed staff and culture here at Vanderbilt University. So having said that, let me jump on to a couple other things, which which uh, Eric touched on. But, you know, we we are learning a lot about Omicron and it's a good news, bad news situation. The bad news situation is that we know that it is far more contagious than previous variants. And um, that makes all of us nervous. And Jim Kendall's going to talk later about the psychological stress of this pandemic. But we do know that although vaccinations don't necessarily keep you from developing an infection, they absolutely are effective at preventing severe illness. And that's really what this is all about at this point. Point. We are not going to eradicate uh, the Omicron variant or any other variant anytime soon. But what we can do is protect the health of our population and prevent hospitalizations and death through vaccination, including boosters. And I'm sure many of you are debating, do I boost, do I not boost? But the evidence is clear that if you are eligible for a booster, it will help prevent you getting an infection but more importantly, also protect, prevent severe illness. And so I, I agree with Eric, every, every sentence I finish with get your booster, get your booster, because it really is what you can do to protect yourself. We're watching very closely all of the trends nationally and internationally to predict the peak, as Eric said. We don't really know. Um, it's hopeful because of the information out of South Africa that it peaked so quickly and it is coming down very, very quickly. So we hope that's what's gonna happen in this country. Um, it is. Omicron is typically far less serious than we saw with the Delta variant. If you think about the way your body responds to an immune response when you get a virus, what Omicron does is tends to infect the upper respiratory area, so your throat and nose, and not really become invasive into your lungs. And you know, when we were dealing with Delta, what we heard about was people who very quickly, their lungs essentially quit functioning. Uh, particularly for those who were unvaccinated. So we believe the evidence so far indicates that this is a much milder infection for most people, particularly if you are fully vaccinated, including a booster. So that's the good news um, uh, about it. If there is a silver lining, that is it. So let me tell you a little bit about what we're seeing in our current cases. We're seeing a number of cases, and many of you know that because your colleagues your coworkers, your family members are currently positive. Um, we, most of those are reporting minor symptoms and most of those resolve. I believe Pam has frozen, all right. We'll see if we can get Pam back on. Until then, let's just sort of move forward until we get um, Pam back up and running. Um, so we will just fast forward and we will bring up Cleo Rucker to the stage. He's our Associate Vice Chancellor and Chief Human Resources Officer 
Hello, Cleo. <laughs> um, Morning, so I have a question for you. Um, we are now going on almost two years since the pandemic began. Can you tell me how the university is working to support staff, whether working in person or remotely, through employee learning engagement and benefits? Yes, um, absolutely. Uh, thank you, Crystal. And you know you're really closely tied with the work that you're doing in our, with our supporting efforts. So, yeah. um, and thank you all today for uh, joining us. And thank you for the work that you're doing to keep the university going. Um, it's been two years and we have been working to uh, all together to support the university and the efforts. And when I think about the support and I think about the buckets that you mentioned, employee learning and engagement and benefits, I think about you know the resources that we have, like for example, what we're doing right now and what we've done in that space. Uh, for the most part, the university has created and HR has been really central in the creation of a lot of resources that allow the employees to continue with their ongoing growth and development and um, their, uh, while um, they are in their roles. So for example, we've created our resources to help individuals navigate what it looks like working re remotely in the Zoom world. Um, we started early on in the process in creating different, um, different uh, modules that uh, help to provide the employees with uh, resources um, to in videos to uh, really stay connected to the university, but to manage life during this time. For example, we created um, a module that deals with Zoom and virtual meeting fatigue. Um, we deal with what's, what are the best practices for um, dealing with remote work in the common pitfalls. Also, um, really helping us manage our you know, digital body language and what that means. So we've created some resources for the employees to help just navigate the, the space and the time that, um, you know, in, in where we are right now. And a lot of those resources are found uh, on a university's website. When I also think about the employee learning and the development of the employees, yes, we've been in this pandemic for two years and we're entering our th um, third year, but so many of you have done such a great job of continuing to not only um, you know, continue to do the work um, that you do daily, but also to develop along the way. And we have um, built out and have the resource of um, the Oracle, uh, what's in Oracle Learn, um, is which provides some self-paced training for each and every employee to you know really jump in and to do the training that and at at their own pace and at their own time. So I still want to uh, encourage all of us to you know really look at what we have in the Oracle Learn system. But in addition to that, Crystal, your employee learning and engagement team, you've continued to offer countless courses for um, the staff here at Vanderbilt and the leaders here. Um, I'm excited to say that since uh, June of uh, this past year, we had 500 employees who went through the strength finders. And that is just that one of the first steps to building upon identifying the strengths and growing in our roles themselves. Um, also, our ELE team continues to offer um, the uh, Zoom and online trainings. We've had some uh, trainings that were, you know, in-person campus trainings, but of course, the pandemic has uh, required us to back out of that space. In addition, we've had some things like the um, TEDx, which we, uh, TEDx Vanderbilt, when we had, you know, three uh, amazing leaders from Vanderbilt who um, really participated and gave some great, uh, great uh, speeches during the TEDx event. So when I think about our employee learning space, there's a lot that we're continuing to do, but we don't want to stop at what we've done. We want to continue to build on that. So I want to encourage you all to continue to stay close to the ELE team, to the HR website, to do, you know, to see what we have um, there. Um, you know, one of the things that's been huge, and Eric mentioned it, Pam mentioned it, and Jim will talk a lot about it, is our mental health and benefits space. I um, am glad to say that there's not a meeting that I attend with our top leaders where we don't talk about mental health and what we're doing in that space. Um, our benefits team, what we're, the work that we're working with them on and to build out the resources that we have continue to grow there. For example, we established a well-being subcommittee to help us talk and help us examine and explore the options and the resources that we have. If you look at the HR website, we have a tab there that talks about work-life uh, integration and work-life harmony. There's countless mental health resources that are there and that are available for each and every one of us. But also, I just want to note that, uh, take it even a step deeper, that um, with, with the development and the rollout of our benefits, we wanted to make sure that we are highlighting to mental health and wellness and how important it is to us. So uh, we made telephonic behavior health resources available to all plan participants. So um, you know, we continue to build out these resources. We continue to work in this space, um, but we we will continue to develop this, and we have these conversations as we have these conversations. But I just wanted to point out a few of those there. 
um, Crystal, and um, I know that Jim will talk some more about some of these benefits and what we're doing as a university to provide our employees the support that they need. Thank you so much, Cleo. And I know that the ELE team is super excited to be a part um, of all of those offerings. And there's so much more coming your way, I promise. <laughs> um, and now we have Pam back. So Pam, we're going to reverse back to you. Of course, want you to finish your remarks. And then we do have a couple of questions for you. Okay, again, I'm sorry. I'm gonna need a little help from Jim Kendall at the end of this or <laughs> around my stress from the technology. Um, but the, the trends we're seeing in contact tracing, I'll jump to that. We are seeing household contacts, um, uh, you know, that, that is very clearly, we are clearly seeing trends related to, to travel and holiday, um, which we expected to see. We are seeing clusters in friends groups. So people who hang out together and go out to dinner together and go to happy hour together, we're seeing some clusters in those groups. We are seeing some spread in work groups, but typically those work groups are people who socialize and work together. So it's really hard to say that it was acquired in, in the work setting per se. But if you are hanging out together and somebody in your group is positive, you're, you are at high risk. Um, you'll see some changes in contact tracing. Uh, Andrea George and her team in the command center has done an amazing job of processing the increased cases we're seeing. We're working through contact tracing. We had a really rapid cycle time and we've slowed that down a little bit because of the number of cases. And you're likely to see some changes, including some automation of the cases that are fairly routine. So more to come on that, um, but, but rest assured that the entire team, the command center team, the contact tracing team, senior leaders in terms of rapid decision making are all working all the time to keep our campus as safe as possible. Let me touch on the testing requirements quickly because you know we made some changes to that. And um, we are asking that people test before they return to campus or return to campus activities for those of individuals. Staff is going to be done on a rotational basis, so you are not required to test until you receive notice from your supervisor that you need to test. And we've already put a couple of groups through who are at particularly risky work situations um, and are seeing that. If you do want to test, go ahead. You do not have to submit a negative test. You, you do, however, need to submit a positive test if you get it so we can get you in the system. And that you can do that on the website. Um, we will, uh, symptomatic testing for people with symptoms remains available at the Occupational Health Center and in the community. So if you have symptoms, go get tested. We're very lucky to have access to that kind of testing when many communities are struggling with that. Um, then I will also say that as we move back to full operations and students are back, um, we will be requiring those individuals who choose not to provide proof of vaccination to test twice a week. We will be requiring those individuals who, who are vaccinated but do not pro provide proof of boosting to test once a week. And the boosted individuals will go into what we call our Sentinel testing program, which means we'll select just a sample once a week to test to give us a feel for what's going on on our campus. And finally, just rest assured, we are on this. We know this is stressful for everybody. We're all worried about it, but we're, we're gonna keep doing those best practices to keep us as safe as possible. I'll stop there, Crystal. Okay, thank you. It's very helpful to learn about the many efforts our campus is taking. We have two additional questions for you. And the first one is, what is Vanderbilt's plan if we were to experience a major outbreak or influx of new cases? So good question. Our plan is what we've done all along, which is remain incredibly agile and facile as we both make decisions and implement change. And we, we have a number of scenarios that we've um, gone through, and I would say that all options are on the table. Um, and, and we will continue to monitor daily, really, and have good communications with our leaders and make the best decisions possible based on the evidence we have. Excellent. And the second question is, what recommendations do you have for staff who are returning to campus to work in person? How can they keep themselves as healthy as possible? So the first recommendation you might guess is boost. <laughs> Get your booster if you have not done so already. 
The second is, you know, universal masking indoors is required. We recommend an N95, a KN95, as uh, Eric said, or similar mask. Um, and stay away from people as much as you can. I would avoid eating with people, quite frankly, um, to the extent that you can, because we know that, you know, we know from history that transmission during meals is significant, is fairly significant. So use caution and, and put those best practices in place. I'm sure many of you are parents and you're worried about your unvaccinated children at home. We are seeing increased hospitalizations in children, but that's because there's increased case numbers, not necessarily because they're sicker than they were previously. Mm -hmm. But if you have children in the home who are eligible for vaccination, get them vaccinated. It's their best protection against severe illnesses. Most of the, the hospitalizations we're seeing with children are either unvaccinated children or children who have significant health uh, comorbidities. Um, if you have children who are not eligible in your home, the best way you can protect them is surround them with a cocoon of people who are vaccinated. Because even if you get an infection, you are it's likely to last for less time if you are vaccinated and your viral load will be lower if you're vaccinated. Um, so your children are at less risk for getting it if, if you're protecting yourself. So I will stop there, Crystal. And, and um, again, get your booster. Thank you. Thank you for those updates. Now, our next panelist is Jim Kendall. He is the manager of Work Life Connections. And Jim, before we jump into questions, can you tell us what Work Life Connections is doing to support staff throughout the year and more specifically during the pandemic? Yes, Crystal, thank you. You know, we are all living in a complex time. Um, it's the most complex time I've had in my life, and I'm sure it is for you. Um, you know, and it really has affected all of our mental health. It doesn't matter who's on this call, we have all been impacted. And anxiety and depression have really spiked since 2020. Um, and it takes a toll on most of us. You know, we, we've experienced increased stressors like fear of infection, especially with this uh, Omicron. Um, we we um, have had to adapt over and over again. And we've done well, but we, you know, it's, that's stressful. Um, we've had different routines, more isolation, um, so the child care issues, and then we're all coping with changes uh, left and right and trying to understand what's going on. And there's misinformation out there. And then there's a flood of information. And it's really hard to, to discern all this. We've dealt with grief. Many people have dealt with losses of such a magnitude during this time. Friends, family who have died or gotten ill or just major changes in the way we do things. And you know, one of the grief I feel is that when I walk along, I can't see people's smiles because you know we're, we're, we're masked. And, and I, I wanna remind everybody that we have all experienced the pandemic trauma and stress experience, PTSE. The American Psychoanalytic Association has labeled that, and, and I, I like hearing about that because it's not a diagnosable mental health issue by any means, but it's a shared experience that we all have. Globally, we have increased stress, grief, loss, and yes, resilience. And we, we've shown that an amazing amount of resilience here at Vanderbilt. The definition of pandemic trauma and stress experience is a buildup of emotional and interpersonal disruptions. Um, and, and we've had to adapt to that new normal over and over again. And we're not done. Um, I don't want to know any more Greek letters. Um, you know, and, and, and so you know, there's been uncertainty that, that, that we deal with. And uncertainty has a lot to do with stress. And, and there's a little extra danger. Everybody I know, and I, I'll put myself right in the center of that, is more tired. And people are on a short fuse. And so sometimes you just have to pause and compose yourself and, and take a deep breath um, and then give grace, please, because everybody's dealing with something. So I think Vanderbilt is rich with resources. And I want to tell you about the resource that we offer at Work Life Connections EAP, which is an internal employee assistance program contracted by Vanderbilt to serve faculty, staff, and postdocs. 
And an employee assistance program is designed to have rapid access for uh, employees to identify and be assisted in resolving uh, personal and workplace stresses through individual assessment, through brief solutions focused counseling, performance coaching, and referrals for community uh, resources that might need more specialized care. And um, we also provide strategic work group dynamic support to leaders and teams. And a lot of folks aren't really familiar with that, but with the uncertainty of the coronavirus and certainly the way everyone's dealing with things, organizational changes, continued adjustments that we're all making, Work-Life Connections has had the opportunity to join a lot of teams to address well-being and normalize conversations in the workplace about the importance of mental health. And no time in the past has mental health been more important than right now. And I want to uh, welcome any of your groups uh, to invite us to uh, be a part of some of your staff meetings. And unfortunately, in an enterprise our size, you know, there are challenging events that occur that impact us. And sometimes it's the death of a student. It may be the death of a coworker or faculty member or, or some other stressful incident that influences the well-being of our Vanderbilt community, uh, community. And I hope that people will give us a call then because we facilitate critical incident stress management, group discussions, and individual work to help people process the emotional impact of traumatic events. Our services are all confidential. They're only kept in our office and uh, not disclosed elsewhere. Um, and, and we offer our services virtually uh, and that provides an, a layer of, of ease and, and safety. But there are some people that really wanna see a, a live person and we will be here as long as everybody's masked. And so we'll be in our masks and we'll be socially distanced and, and we will expect the same for folks. Um, but I, I'd like everybody to just take a moment to put our phone number in your contact list. And it's 615-936-1327. And the reason I want you to do that is because we are a community and sometimes you will notice one of your coworkers struggling or they'll be talking to you about things that, that are really troubling them. And the way you can take an action is to say, hey, I know a resource that can help you. And to give them that number, 615-936-1327. And we can help coordinate them getting an appointment with us so that you'll know a handy resource. And the last thing I just want to mention is kind of a roadmap for getting through these storms. And uh, interesting that I'm thinking of storms both pandemically and today certainly was a storm. Um, but, but we've always got to acknowledge our thoughts and feelings and they change. Um, we, we, they evolve and, and we've got to strive for patience and tolerance in ourselves and in, in our uh, others and also practice acceptance. Um, we're all trying to do the very best we can and, and navigate this unique time, but, but we're going to be imperfect and we've got to accept that. We need to take personal responsibility to do self-care. At no time in my life has self-care meant more or been more helpful. Exercise, good nourishment, mindfully taking breath, uh, breaks from the heaviness of the world, um, maybe turn off the news, and, and connect with people who, who are nurturing to you, um, and then find your deeper gear. Um, and I think, you know, we get into why do we do this, and it's our mission and, and purpose, and we do it well, and, and then we've got to listen to each other and validate our own feelings and, and the feelings of our coworkers and then make sure we're engaging. So I'll turn it back to you, Crystal. Thank you so much, Jen, for that great information. Now, I want to now, we're gonna move into sort of our question and answer period. And Pam, we have a flurry of testing questions. So I'm gonna um, give these to you and hopefully you can provide some, some great responses to these. I know you can. So this is our first question. I see that you've set up required COVID testing for returning to campus. 
if we've tested positive for COVID last semester and are still within the 90 days where we are exempt from testing, are we exempt from this testing as well? And if we are not testing, do we need to notify you or do you have records of who has previously tested positive and is exempt? So that's a great question. It's been <laughs> quite a source of confusion. So if you are within 90 days of testing positive, you should not participate in asymptomatic testing. So we actually don't want you to test because you may be positive when it's picking up an old infection. Our testing is incredibly uh, sensitive. So, but you need to have notified us that you were positive. So you need to provide, um, fill out the, the form, the survey on the health and safety website and give us notice. And then that's all you need to do. We don't, you don't have to tell us you're not testing because you were positive in the last 90 days if you've already notified us. Okay, perfect. And a follow up to that is if we are not eligible for the booster until later this month, is it necessary to go through testing on campus? Um, you will be considered in compliance if you are uh, appropriately boosted and you're ineligible for a booster yet. The, the logic is that during that period of time, your immunity has not faded. So you are not at higher risk than somebody who's not been boosted. So we, we absolutely encourage you to get boosted as soon as you can, but you will be considered compliant and not have to participate in that weekly testing. Excellent, thank you. So this is a kind of a Cleo or Pam question. I'll let you all decide who it goes to first. Do remote workers need to participate in on-campus testing? Uh, I'll take that Cleo, the answer is no. Uh, we, we don't want you to have to come to campus to test. Uh, <laughs> You know, so no, if you're working remotely, you're exempt from that testing. And that's one of the reasons that we're doing staff in a rotational basis versus just saying everybody go test because teasing through who is and is not remote from a central standpoint is, is very difficult. Excellent, thank you. And now Cleo, here's a question for you or Eric. If our children's school system switches to virtual learning, Will all departments be expected to allow employees greater liberty to work from home? You know, the great thing is that we have been working through some of this already because we're at year three of this. Um, I will, uh, every, our leaders have been extremely understanding, have been working with the staff to uh, find ways to get work done and find ways to accommodate the different situations. And I, in that situation, we will continue to encourage leaders to do just that and to support them and um, support our employees and um, in, during these, you know, really different, you know, unique times. Eric? Uh, yeah, yeah, thanks, Cleo. And thanks for that question, uh, Crystal. I just wanna kind of underscore a couple points here. So the answer to that question in my mind, is yes. And I'll just say, you know, flexibility and adaptability are key reasons we've been as successful as we've been to date throughout the pandemic. And I personally always strongly urge units to allow for as much flexibility as possible for their staff. And of course, the only additional thing I'll add is that I acknowledge that job responsibilities do vary substantially across the university. And that's why we generally empower leaders at the local level to make the best decisions for their staff. And again, we have to emphasize flexibility to the highest extent possible. Excellent, thank you all so much. And Eric, I'm gonna throw this one to you as well. Um, will dining be outdoor once again or will indoor dining be limited or prohibited? Um, yeah, great question, uh, Crystal. So during, you know, when the students um, get back, the undergraduates will be coming back um, this weekend to start classes on the, uh, actually next weekend um, for the 18th. But during the initial period when the students come back, there's gonna be this Commodore Cares period that we talked about that goes through um, no less than January 24th. And during that period, all dining um, on campus is gonna be in a to-go format. Um, and as with all other protocols, we're gonna reassess you know, as we move forward. So my hope and honestly my belief is that we will be back to a more normal indoor dining arrangement um, as soon as we get past this Omicron surge. Okay, excellent, thank you. 
Now, Pam, I want to go back to some um, questions that deal with testing and mask. Um, so in our area, getting an appointment for a COVID test is challenging at best. Will at-home COVID tests or results be accepted to return to campus, or does it have to be performed at a pharmacy? So again, uh, at-home testing to return to campus is not um, required at, at this point unless you've been notified by your supervisor that you need to test. If you've been notified by your supervisor, then uh, our testing center is available to you. And the reason we do that is staff um, should get on be on paid time to, um, sorry, staff should be on paid time to be able to do that. So go to our testing center and get tested that's readily available there, okay? If you are doing an at-home test and it's positive, we will accept that as a positive result. So let's say you have the sniffles and you've got an at-home test and you do it, absolutely send those in to us because we are accepting those at this point in time. Excellent. And then a question, a question about masks. Are KN95 masks required for campus community members? So they are not required, but they are strongly recommended, just like the CDC. And, and let me just say, we've had a lot of questions about providing them for people and that they're, you know, we recognize they may be hard to get and they may have become expensive. So we're looking at all of our options with that. But at this point in time, um, they are not required, but recommended. And we know from the evolving science, they protect a lot better with Omicron than the traditional surgical or cloth masks that we've all grown accustomed to wearing. Excellent, thank you. Now, Pam, this is another question for you. Looking ahead to once the Omicron wave has passed, I know we're all looking forward to that, what kinds of metrics and endpoints are being used to determine when masking requirements and other restrictions will be relaxed on campus? Are we looking at cases, transmission rates, vaccination rates, hospital capacity, or something else? And are we focused on campus numbers or Nashville community numbers, national numbers, or something else? So the answer to that, Crystal, is all of the above. <laughs> <laughs> we, we look at essentially a, a, you know, a number of, of parameters and we watch clearly what's happening on campus, clearly what's happening locally, clearly what is the, what's going on with our healthcare system and how stretched is our healthcare system to be able to relax some things. Because part of what we're trying to do, again, is protect our community resources so we don't overwhelm our community resources. We watch national trends and international trends. A, a lot of what we did was informed actually out of watching South Africa and what was going on there. And that helped us make some decisions, you know, about what we were going to do in terms of pushing uh, return to camp us back and those types of things. So we will watch all of those. And very importantly, we watch all the CDC recommendations and the health department regulations. We, we clearly um, use those as sort of the gold standard. For our testing program, we certainly will evaluate how many people we continue to test in the asymptomatic testing program, depending on what's going on with case counts, et cetera. Excellent, thank you. Now, Eric, this question is for you. Will visitors such as external campus vendors or human participants in lab research be able to come to campus in person? Um, they'll be able to come crystal when absolutely necessary and they'll be asked to follow all of the, um, all of the campus protocols. Okay, excellent. All right. So thank you all so much for all of your responses. We are, if there are any more questions, Catherine, okay. We are at the end of our time together today. I wanna to thank all of the panelists for all of your incredible responses and my special thanks to everyone who submitted questions from the audience. We're also keeping a record of any questions that we didn't get to today so that we can address them on the health and safety protocols website. And a recording of this town hall will also be there for later viewing. So thank you again to our panelists for being here and thank you all so much for attending. This concludes our town hall and I really hope you have a great rest of your afternoon and weekend. Thank you.